Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Animation Panel Palooza presented by Wacom. We're going to let a few people uh, find their way into this little uh, stream of ours today. And then we're going to get started. So I'm just going to go over a couple of things that we're going to do today. Uh, this panel, or, well, this panel Palooza, rather, <laughs> is going from 1 o'clock all the way to 6 o'clock. And we are very grateful to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Um, today we have four segments. And the first one is going to be an animation panel filled with these fine animation professionals uh, called Making Art for the Screen. Then after that, we have a game called Doodle Decode, where professional animation artists are going to challenge themselves in a game of visual interpretation. Let's put it that way. Um, afterward, we have a game called Trivia Mash, which is going to be straight up animation trivia and animation history trivia. Afterward, we will be having our ultimate Pictionary game, which is a Pictionary, but the words are a little bit less tangible. So we are going to go ahead and get started with our first panel uh, in a couple minutes. So we're just going to chill out and hang out and welcome you as you come in. I see Michael Kolowski. Well, the, the names are coming up too quick. Sabine M and yeah. Alejandro Rixia and Katie Zhang and Adam Gold and Chris Be Prouty. Fast, dude. Yeah, they're way too fast. They're all joining way too fast. I saw I Carlos and Angela, Mac, Jimmy, Juan. Oh boy, that's so many people. I'm on and Alex and Jasmine and Jensen <laughs> and Robert and Elizabeth and Sam and Jason and Carlos and Lauren and Kunal and, oh, Kunal, I think I know Kunal. Um, Sam Flores. Dude, and, right? <laughs> well, I, I was teaching a class that had Kunal in it, if it's the same Kunal. And Sam Bull and Lisa and Kofi and Talia and John. Oh, and, John's here. And Sandra and Paul <laughs> and Molly. So thank oh you guys gosh. all for joining us. Cause, and this is, this is a lot of exciting. people. Yeah. This is very exciting. This is neat. I didn't know how the chat was going to work. It's so cool that we can just kind of like read it here. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to give everybody a few more minutes to, uh, to come on in. And then we're actually going to start our panel at about one ten. Uh, we're going to be taking, uh, we're going to be taking questions from the chat and uh, we're going to be answering you guys' questions about animation and about how animation is made and what all we need, what all you need to do um, to make your work really stand out um, and tips and tricks on things to look for when you're actually making your artwork for, for the screen, as opposed to for print or as opposed to for the web etc cetera, etc cetera. so we're just going to chat amongst ourselves for about uh, another uh, seven minutes and let everybody kind of come in and filter in and then we will get started cool nice. already a lot of participants it's really exciting i know hi yeah. everybody <laughs> yeah i see somebody like, like nick says he's busting out in notebook for the first time in forever <laughs> for you y'all should totally doodle while you watch yeah Absolutely. We've already got out. a couple of questions too. Awesome. Nice. That's the way to do it. And the Wacom staff is going to be on top of the chat and answering your guys' questions. And they will hand the questions in to us when uh, we are ready to answer all those questions. So keep them coming, you guys. And um, we are going to try and answer them to the best of our ability. And if there's any examples that we have uh, just lying around and all of our stuff, then we will uh, put those up on screen. Hey, Mike, it's Doug. Uh, somebody's asking if the panels will be available later to download. Um, that's an Elizabeth or Tom question. It'll all be on YouTube. Check it out will YouTube. all be on YouTube. <laughs> all six wonderful hours. Yeah, oh, love it. Thanks, Tom. Oh, boy. <laughs> Even the commercial breaks. Oh man, I, those I, are my favorites. I also see you got a you got a, a compliment here, Mike, uh, from Raquel. Love your background. Oh, yeah. thank you, Raquel. Those are all Mike. Yep. Oh, Mike, you made them. Yeah. Dude, they these, look great. These were taken from the larger picture, um, which was we did for promotional, which I did for promotional art. 
So Oops, I can sorry. like try and move out of the way a little bit. You gotta make your chair disappear, dude. I can't make my chair disappear. Well, <laughs> sucks. <laughs> yeah, I knew I went into the wrong thing. I should have got into sleight of hand magic. <laughs> not too late. It's not too late. It's yeah, not. right. I could rebrand myself and be the the animation magician. Yeah, there you go. That's a great idea. You could animate like things going on behind you, like Gertie the dinosaur. You could be. Mm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, get some of that vaudeville action happening. There you go. Then you get uh, your own shot at Magic Castle and. <laughs> Oh, yeah, goodness. then everyone bothers you for passes to Magic Castle. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I guess that's better than everybody bothering me to go to Disneyland. That so. is true, yeah. <laughs> hey, Mike, every, by the way. Yeah, every Disney employee knows the... Mm -hmm. the yeah. Because it, it starts as sort of a look like... Mm, hey... I um, mean, they ask you yeah. that until you, until you tell them that you have to go with them, and then they're like, oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've never gotten that. They love having me with them. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's one of those things. Yeah, I, I've had that before where it's like, oh, you mean I can't just go and you can make a phone call or something? And it's like, mm, no, not really. But yeah, then you have to explain the concept of blackout dates. and. Oh, oh yeah. gosh, yeah. That's the worst. I didn't even know that was a thing until I moved out here. Yeah, because apparently Disneyland has a capacity, and uh, That's so guy, this guy called the fire marshal has to come out <laughs> when it's too full. Yeah, who do they think they are being fire, fire marshal? Don't they know they have their own fire station on Main yeah. Street? <laughs> yeah, Pluto's the fire chief. Come on, or, or, yeah. or Goofy. Goofy's the fire chief. Oh, man, it's Goofy's fault that there's a limit to the amount of people you can have in Disneyland. That's a bummer. Yeah, yeah Goofy yeah. ruined it for everybody. You'd think like Bad. he'd be really lax with the rules, being so <laughs> rather unintelligent. <laughs> but we love Goofy, and he makes me laugh. So. Gorsh. I... I was actually on on DuckTales. Uh, the episode just came out, I believe, that had Goofy in it. That's so sick. Mm. So, That's yeah, awesome. we we were able to dive into a lot of well, the people that were running the show <laughs> were mm. able to dive into a lot of that stuff, and um, that was really fun to see. Um, the uh, San Diego Comic Con panels were pretty wild. When they would, uh, when our head writer Frank would accidentally show um, some of the the stuff that was coming up from the from the new show. Oh my gosh! But all right, so we're getting all all clear to go ahead. So let's get our panel started. Um, let's go through and all introduce ourselves. Uh, Pete, why don't you start us off? Oh, okay, my name is Pete Michaels. I'm currently supervising director on a brand new show at Netflix, which has not been announced yet, so I can't really talk about it, but. Uh, before that, I was uh, supervising on uh, Future Worm with Mike. Uh, I was uh, supervising director on Rick and Morty for season one and two. Uh, directed on Family Guy, directed on Simpsons, and a whole bunch of pilots and Rugrats and a whole bunch of fun stuff that I've been fortunate enough to work on in my career. Uh, Vicky, why don't you go next? Hi, everybody. My name is Victoria Ying, and I am a visual development artist. I uh, worked at Disney for eight years and Sony Pictures Animation for one. Um, my film credits include Tangled, Frozen, Wreck-It Ralph, Big Hero 6, and Moana. Uh, currently, I'm a graphic novelist, and my first book, City of Secrets, oh, there you go. comes out. Uh, so this book comes out July 28th. So uh, check it out in stores everywhere. Hype. And we're gonna be putting uh, links to everybody's socials in the chat, so... Um, Feel free to follow them and, you know, check out City Secrets. Uh, Carly, why don't you go next? Hi, I'm Carly. I'm an animator. So I've done things like work on Mr. Pickle Season 4 slash Mama Named Me Sheriff, animated on Midnight Gospel. I did retakes on Central Park. Um, and, yeah, I just kind of draw a lot of weird things, get paid to do it, and it's great. I draw front butts, and you can't take that away from me. <laughs> <laughs> And I am Mike Morris. I am a storyboard artist and director, and I've worked on shows like The Simpsons, uh, Future Worm with Pete, uh, which was a joyous experience, and a show called DuckTales, which is uh, going into its 
third season and having uh, new shows coming out all the time. So that was a, a really cool thing. And then on to my next adventure. But currently, let's talk about this adventure. We have a panel here and we have a lot of very interesting questions coming through in the chat. So first of all, we have a question from Arlette Franco. And I'm just gonna throw this out to everybody first. Um, is it better to focus on one skill or to have a diverse set of skills in a portfolio? I can answer that. Um, so, you know, I looked at a lot of portfolios when I was at Disney. We looked at, you know, a lot of the training and internship portfolios. And, you know, we get that question a lot, like, which is it better to focus on? Should I be good at everything or should I just pick one thing? And I think that the truth of the matter is you should be completely authentic to yourself and to your own art. If you hate doing backgrounds, don't do them because we can tell when you hate something. So just be absolutely like true to whatever it is that you like because character designers, at least a, a Disney feature. So let me preface this by saying all advice is autobiographical and everything that I say is going to be from my own point of view in terms of my own experience. So, um, in feature studios, character designers and background and prop designers, those are separate jobs. Um, I was a generalist, which meant that I did props, backgrounds, and sometimes characters and costumes. But uh, the character designers pretty much just did that. So if you want to focus on character design, that's absolutely a valid choice to make. And you know, if you like doing backgrounds and props, then absolutely make your portfolio very broad. That's what I did. I really liked backgrounds and props, and I liked doing characters. So my portfolio is very diverse, but it doesn't mean that it's the best type of portfolio. They really like to see someone who has passion and authenticity in their work. So if you're just presenting something because you think you need to have it, we can tell and it's not a good idea. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, oh, sorry, Pete. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I agree. I, I think also, because I work primarily in, in TV animation, um, a lot of adult animation shows, and what we look for is, I mean, it's good to, to um, focus on, if you're going for a background, job as background designer for instance you're going to want to put background designs in there you're not going to going to have a lot of horses and you know different you know characters and things focus on what your what your your goal is what your job goal is if you're going for storyboards well then you're going to have to have a lot of storyboards in there it's always a good idea and I, i've i've had different uh, heard different things from different supervising directors too like i i know one says, I don't look at, you know, people put life drawing in there. I don't even look at it. I hate drawing life, life drawing. I don't want to see it. I don't want to, but I know why other people put it in there. I personally like to see it because it tells me that you can draw and I, 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 it's easier for me to cha train you in a specific style of a show than it is for me to give you basic drawing uh, 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 lessons. So I think the, the, the biggest thing for me I look for is like, is, is the focus. If you're going to be a character designer, let's see your characters let's see turnarounds let's see different style, styles of characters let's see different types of people different types of animals different monsters robots whatever they are aliens um and just focus on it and 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 if you want if, if you do have a desire to be maybe have different uh pages on your website to like well here's my character designs maybe here's my storyboards because you might be uh interested in doing a bit of both i mean i my own personal experience is i i kind of i started as a background artist on the Simpsons and then went from there to character layout to storyboards, the animation timing. I just kind of asked questions along the way. So I kind of was absorbing every bit of information. I think that helped me become a director. As, a, as someone whose career is a lot younger and as someone who's less experienced, I would definitely say that um, you really do want to focus on the one thing that you want to do and you want to hone your passions in on that and then focus on expanding outwards because um, I, I know like when, when I was a student, right, and I was looking to get into the animation industry, um, my, my animation industry friends would be like, okay, well, what job are you looking for? And I'd be like, oh, well, I could totally do anything. Like, I'm just up for whatever. And that's not, that's not helpful. Like, so even if your portfolio <laughs> might um, have a bunch of different things in it, which is good to be a well-rounded artist, but you can't just say, all right, well, I want to be a storyboarder and I want to be a character designer and I want to go do, go do backgrounds. Like you kind of just have to choose one and go with it. And if you don't like it, then it's okay to switch. It's okay to start over and decide that you want to do something else. But um, yeah, I would definitely say like, try to hone in on one thing to get your foot in the door. And then if you want to branch out after that, then go for it. But you've got to have the stuff in your portfolio. 
Uh, yeah. Can I add to that? I also think that like you can have multiple portfolios. Yeah. So okay. you can have a storyboarding portfolio and you can have a background portfolio and you can have a character design portfolio. If you want to go for all those different jobs, that would probably be the way to do it because that way the recruiters, they know like, okay, well, you're applying for this job. I understand because this portfolio is very focused. Um, but you know, it, it again, depends on what you like to do. If you hate backgrounds, don't do them. But at the same time, like when you're presenting your work to somebody, it should feel focused and it should feel like we understand what job you're applying for. Yeah, and, I, and going back to your authentic, authenticity point, um, Victoria, there's, I don't know, I feel like there's so much um, carbon copy culture going on right mm -hmm. now where people aren't necessarily bringing what they personally bring to the table. They're bringing what they think other people want to see to the table. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's like having a conversation with somebody who's always trying to um, like anticipate what you're going to say and then trying to say it before you do. Um, yeah, and I also think that like a lot of people get really caught up in copying a style, especially of a specific artist. Like if you're like, oh, well, I know X person works at Disney, so I'm going to make my portfolio look exactly like their work. And the problem with that is Disney already has that person. Like they don't need a second one. What they need is your unique voice. They need someone who's going to bring a different answer to the table. And if you, all you can do is kind of just duplicate what other people do, then that's not really a strong designer. And that's not somebody who is really going to help grow the studio and grow kind of the, the, the visual voice of the, the, the studio. Yeah, and, and for storyboards, if you're going for a storyboard position, you're going to want to have a variety of stuff. Because it, it is different, even in TV animation, I look for different things for an adult animation show than I would for a kid's show. There's different sensibilities, different styles. So I'm looking at your portfolio as casting in a way, whereas if I see realistic perspective and realistic human characters, I know, okay, that'll be good for, for this show, but maybe not necessarily for a more stylized um, graphic looking show. So yeah. it's, it's a hard sell to have a portfolio is. that's got yeah. like a grizzly bar fight in it and uh you're casting for a pre-k yeah exactly exactly like maybe leave out the the booby girls with the armor on it if you're applying right. for like like a preschool yeah. show yeah yeah if you're right exactly exactly if you've worked if you've worked on rick and morty and and family guy and big mouth well then you're gonna want to you know you know, be particular about which ones you're gonna show but show yeah. you know something that has but really what i'm looking for is is the staging the storytelling um the performance of the characters with you know tell that story in in your storyboards and, and and have a variety of like different scenarios in your storyboards like with not just like people sitting on the couch and here's another one of people sitting on the couch there's another one show a variety of, of different stagings that you need to do okay let's go to the next question um there's a, a few questions in here about tools um specifically are we going to go over anything from wacom or are we going to be going over programs like adobe and clip studio um there's a couple other ones that are like uh what kind of tools do you guys use to to do your work um let's just talk about that for a very brief moment um and then we'll just sort of clear all those questions out of the way so what do you guys think about like digital tools and using digital tools as opposed to traditional art tools in animation I mean, I think generally speaking, like digital tools have just sped up the process. Oh, the recording stopped. Oh, anyways. Um, yeah, so I think that like, you know, digital tools have really helped speed up the process. Like I don't draw on paper anymore because it just saves me a step. I don't have to scan or take a photo of it. So um, I draw almost entirely straight into Photoshop. I use a Wacom 21 inch Cintiq at home and uh, Photoshop is pretty much my main tool. Um, I do also use something called Comic Draw on my iPad, which helps me with my graphic novels. I use a hammer. <laughs> no. It was really I, weird in the Future Worm office my first couple of weeks. You'd hear this, bam, 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 coming yeah, from I, the office. And yeah, you know, the IT guys were getting on my case too much, so I had to stop breaking equipment. But yeah, I use, I have, uh, I actually have a, an, an older model, 21 UX uh, Wacom tablet, which still works great. I have no issues with it. Still works, works great. But I use, I do love the, um, the, the newer ones we have at, at the office when we, right now we're out of the office working from home but i do miss the uh the new one which has you know the wider screen and has it's a lot uh, more responsive but i think originally because i started working on paper uh and we were doing storyboards on paper and scanning them and and it was you know full of post-its and scotch tape 
And it is so much easier just to, to use, because we use Storyboard Pro for TV animation. Some productions use uh, Flash. I know Bojack Horseman is using Flash. Some uh, will also use Photoshop and for Storyboards. But Storyboard Pro seems to be, for my Toon Boom, seems to be the uh, current industry standards. But also, I, I've heard Features also uses uh, Flix, I think it is. Um, so there's other there's a lot of different programs out there. I I am so used to Storyboard Pro. I I kind of use that as as uh, uh, my Photoshop now too. But but I also use um, it does help to have to use um, SketchUp for visualizing backgrounds and rooms and and different things. So you can visualize like where to put the camera and what's going to be seen through that door, things like that. But uh, um, yeah, the biggest thing for me, I thought was going to be learning how to draw on a screen uh, that making that transition. But the biggest trend, the biggest issue with the transition from going to paper to, to digital storyboards for me was the files. It's, it's so hard to keep track of the files, which one is the original and you have to make sure you constantly version up and keep, keep on top of that and really um, know which one is the latest version because with the paper boards, it was easy. The one with scotch tape and post-its all over it. That's the original. Everything else is a Xerox copy, but with digital files, it's so hard to tell if you make one change, you don't want to have to go through a whole act of storyboards to find like, wait, was this the new one or is this, you know, so always make sure to update your files. Yeah. Yeah. When, when they change uh, version numbers in the middle of a production. Yeah. That's, that's that, yeah. that nice uh, little bit of a week is fun. Yep. Um, especially but, for the revisionists and people that are having to update all the files. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. I would definitely that say that turn. like, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just making oh. a comment. I would definitely say that like the biggest challenge for like digital files is that you have to version up. You have to know the naming conventions and you have to name your files correctly because if you can't read your files, then the rest of the entire pipeline is not going to know what files you're working with. Um, but in terms of like software and stuff, I mean, I still draw on my sketchbook like all the time. I'm actually drawing right now, um, but it's just, it's fun to doodle. But I mean, I, I love my Cintiq. I love drawing on it. Photoshop is great. Harmony is great. Um, but it, it is important to be able to have those like foundational traditional drawing skills because um, the computer is meant to help make your life easier when you draw. It's not meant to cheat you out of those foundational skills. Yeah. And I think you can get really lazy if you don't pay attention yeah. to um, some of that because the mm -hmm. computer makes it so malleable. Like anything you do makes it so malleable. And um, I, I remember an old story that somebody told me about a Disney uh, background designer um, who got was just furious because this was on paper. And um, he's furious because he, he messed up a drawing and he was just having a, you know, a fit. And one of his, uh, you know, coworkers come and came over and said, well, you know, buddy, that's what they make erasers for. <laughs> and he said, they make erasers for people who suck. And then, <laughs> and oh <my> so <laughs> he's, that guy was pretty hardcore, but um, they, uh, you know, I think keeping a nice balance between being able to work digitally and knowing that environment, and then also being able to keep those traditional skills alive I think that balance is is paramount, and I think that your your uh, traditional work is going to push your digital work to other places, and your digital work is going to inform your traditional work as well because you may discover different methods of uh, methodologies of working. All right, yeah. let's go. Sure. Ne next question. All right, I'm almost done with college. Where would I need to go to get art jobs? I'm not great at animation. I see a lot of positions open for software developers, senior animator, etc. Things I can't really do. I uh, draw very well and draw characters, but I don't know if that's good enough. That's a tough question because it really is going to depend on what you want to do. Do you want to be a graphic artist? Do you want to be do you want to be a character designer? Like, what field do you want to go in? Because now, especially with like the pandemic and stuff, you don't technically have to be in Los Angeles to work in animation. Even though I know that some studios do prefer that you still live here. Um, but like in terms of going where the jobs are, I would say if you don't know where to start looking for jobs, it's best to just get to know people in the field that you want to work in because they're going to have a lot of information to give you. Um, a lot of artists are pretty friendly in that regard because we all started there and we all just kind of help lift each other up to that. 
Yeah, I think that's a great answer. I have nothing to add, but I think. Aww, <laughs> thank you. It is. It, 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 your network is so important. And I, I, cause I also teach uh, some college classes and I, I tell everybody, like, look around you. These are your peers. These are your, the people that's your network. This is your network to start off and your network mm -hmm. is going to grow as everybody, you know, gets out there in the field, you know, somebody who knows somebody. And a lot of times I'll get jobs through people I know will call up and say, Hey, or, or email and say, Hey, are you available? We're starting this new show. We're looking for people. So that's, that's the biggest step. But, to, but to start that network, a lot of times, depending on it, it Yes, yeah, so it depends on what you want to do. A lot of times you might have to take a test. The uh, Animation Guild is a good resource for that. Depends yes. on where you live, too. Uh, the Animation Guild has a list of studios. There, um, um, depends on where you live, too. If you're if you're in Canada, I see there are a lot of Canadian uh, posting. Um, there is a large animation community in Toronto, Ottawa, Vancouver, even uh, Nova Scotia, and Halifax. There's studios everywhere: Ireland, Mexico, South America, India. Um, you know, even New York, Chicago, Texas, even. So um, you don't necessarily have to move to LA. Um, union wise, it's, it is a local, so there's, there's that, but, um, but yeah, the, the biggest thing is, is to get yourself known. And, and there are studios, smaller studios that look for people, have an online presence is the biggest thing I hear from studio executives. If you have an online presence, you're starting out and you're putting your own drawings up there, your own style, developing your own style, that gets noticed. So keep, keep doing that. Yeah, I, I think the one thing I would add is like your your skills are not static. So like even if you're not confident where you are right now, that doesn't mean that that's where you're going to be forever. So yes. like if you need a stopgap job right now in order to build up your skills so that you get the job you want, then that is absolutely a valid career move. You don't have to get your dream job right out of college. If you're if you feel like oh well, I want to be a storyboarder but I don't have storyboards, there's a lot of classes that you can take online in order to build that portfolio, and it's okay to like not get a studio job right away. You don't have to take something that you don't want to do, like software development or whatever, just because you feel like, oh, well, I need to be in a studio. Yeah. You don't. You, yeah. you can definitely take the time and develop your skills so that you get the job that you actually are after and not get distracted and kind of like down a path that you didn't intend to. I would like oh. to share something. That's a good moment. I'd like to share something if, if I can, Mike. Yeah. Uh, um, a lot of times you're, you're, you're going to need to take a test, whether it's a design test, a storyboard test, a character test. I had to take a, a I was going for character layout my first job on The Simpsons. I was going right out of college uh, from UCLA and I wanted to get a job doing character to, character layout. Well, I had to take a test. And here I'm going to share with you now uh, what that first drawing was from my very first test uh, compared and next to it I'm, is I corrected it years later. Uh, if you look at the difference, the Homer on the left is my my character layout test, and you can see why they didn't hire me. Oh yeah, and that's uh, that's some season one stuff. <laughs> it's pretty bad. It's it's horrible. Even for season one standards, it's terrible. Uh, I would not have hired me, um, and I took the test twice. So, it, and I never got hired as a character artist from that test. I guess what I had a background in there that, that I could show that I could do perspective. So I was hired as a background layout artist. And then, and then I started to learn how to pose characters, how to break characters down. And then years later, I thought, I found this drawing of like, I can do it, let me just, see, let me just draw over that and see what happens. But that that's, so cool. uh, yeah, just uh, don't be discouraged. You will get there, you will get there. Mm -hmm. I would say too, that if you can get your hands on any kind of test, like even if you totally bomb it, like the studio is not gonna hold that against you. Like I've, I've taken, I've tested for Big Mouth uh, two years in a row now and I don't get the job. And you know, I, I slowly get better. I slowly improve and they're not gonna say, no, your test sucked. So uh, you're never testing for us again. Yeah. No, they, they like seeing the progress. Yeah, definitely. That's a, that's the other thing I would say. Like, you know, some people are afraid to show their portfolios to recruiters because they're like, well, it's not good enough now. And actually, like, recruiters really like to see growth. Yeah. If you change year over year and for the better, then that's something that they'll actually look at and be like, oh, this person's actually like taking notes. They're growing. They're actually being like a malleable source, someone who's actually like going to be very useful in the long run because you know that they can grow. So any chance that you can get in order to like get feedback, take a test, whatever it is that's possible, even if like never be afraid that someone's gonna be like, oh, well you failed once. And that means forever in my mind, you are this person. Yeah. Like recruiters and art directors look for growth and you know, for like, oh, I remember that guy from last year and wow, this is a lot better. Like yep. that is actually very much a mark in your favor. Yeah. yeah, except for unless you're that one guy that spilled coffee all like all over their electronics, then they'll remember you for that. 
Um, yeah. let's, <laughs> let's go to a different question. How do I increase my chances of being accepted into internships? Mm. I mean, the problem with internships is that they are so competitive, you know, like there are so many people applying for them. And at a certain point, you probably have like a thousand submissions and maybe like 20 people who can get it. You know, they're all about the same level and then you can only pick one. So then how do you stand out from that, those 20 to be like, okay, well, these are the 20 that are good enough. Which one are we going to pick? Sometimes it's just random chance. Like, oh, we're working on a tiger movie and this guy has a drawing of a tiger in his portfolio. You can't predict that and you can't, don't try, you know? The, the only thing that you can do is again, come back to authenticity. Do exactly what it is that you love to do. And if it's unique and if it's something that they're actually looking for and they're like, oh, this guy has a unique voice. That's the thing that's going to stand out. Like people that I noticed were people who actually did things that weren't necessarily animation based. Like my portfolio that put, put me into the training program, the thing that they liked from me was actually my fashion illustration. And fashion illustration that wasn't like animation focused or anything like that. It was just a very unique style that they hadn't seen before. And when I reviewed portfolios, people that would stick out in my mind were people who like had some cool ceramics in their portfolios. Like it wasn't <laughs> totally relevant. They'd be like one or two little images at the end. But the fact that they kind of were unique and they actually were, you know, everything that they did was done with passion and with heart. Like that's the thing that's going to put you over the top. And also the fact that they even got to the end of your portfolio says a lot because like sometimes if you, if you, do this uh, thing in your portfolio where you're going to show your growth by putting your worst drawings up front and like building up to the crescendo at the end. No, 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 no. Bad move. You want to uh, start that portfolio off with a bang. You want to yeah. say, boom, I'm here. I have this awesome bit up front. And then you put like first, uh, first picks, second picks, third picks. And then maybe at the end, you'll put another one of the, the higher picks yeah. to sort of cap it off. And then the weakest stuff towards the back. So yeah, definitely start strong and end strong. That's definitely something. And also you're only as good as your worst piece. So whatever your worst piece in your portfolio is, that is the measure by which we can be like, okay, that's how good they are because they thought this was good enough to put in here. Yeah. So look at your portfolio and be very critical about which pieces that you are not confident of because that's the ones that are going to stick out and be like, okay, well, this person maybe doesn't have taste. Yeah, and, and I was going add to, to add to that, to be brutally honest with yourself and your portfolio. Like, really ask yourself, it do, you know, I might like this piece, but is it really good enough? Is it really my best piece? And, and be really honest with yourself. And, you know, sometimes it might come down to something um, simple. that's not even drawing. It just might be just a sense of humor that you show in your, in your in portfolio, or even, you know, something that uh, I know my, my wife, when she got um, her, she was working on Simpsons also, she had a, a children's book. It was right out of college and she had a children's book in her portfolio that was a project from school where you had to take an existing children's book and alter the illustrations, make it something completely different. And that's what got her notice. It wasn't her drawings or anything. It was just like she took this and had this twisted sense of humor on this children's book and that got her noticed. So it might just come down to something like that. And, and it's, it, it, you're right, it is very, it, it's hard to pin down and, and predict, but it could be just your, you know, your passion and your personality that stands out. Okay, let's see. Uh, here's a question. It's a little nebulous, but we could just make quick work of this one. Um, what would I need to get those jobs? How good do you have to be? I mean, that's a little nebulous, but I mean, I would say that as good as you can possibly be. I mean, there's no standard by which like how good you have to be. It's, you know, be the best you can be. You know, put yourself out there and, and give yourself room to grow as an artist. Don't worry so much about how good do I have to be? Do I measure up? It is keep going, keep progressing. So, I mean, I, anybody else have any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, I do want to say that um, you should completely ignore the voice in the back of your head that says that you need to wait until you think you're ready because there are plenty of people currently working in the industry right now who one, are not passionate about it and are doing it just to pay bills, which, you know, isn't a bad thing, of course. And there are other people who you could potentially be surpassing with your skills, but if you're waiting until you feel like you're ready, somebody else is going to get in there before you. And I know as someone who is young and particularly a chick, I like to wait until I feel like I'm ready. And it's scary to put yourself out there, but sometimes you just have to be cocky. You just have to go for it because if you don't go for it, you 
you could have got a job, but instead they gave it to someone else who is possibly not doing the job that you would be able to do. So I would just yeah, say, just get, get rid of that voice, get rid of it. Sometimes entitlement can be good. You know, it definitely mm -hmm. helps you stand up for the things that you actually deserve and makes yes. you go for things that maybe are a little out of reach. And sometimes like you never know what'll happen. Yeah, yeah um, like but you're from, passionate about it. You deserve the job. Yeah, absolutely. You, you deserve know? it. Um, I mean, the thing about how good you need to be is what I did and I recommend to a lot of people is to look at the art of books of the studio you're trying to apply for. So if you want to apply for DreamWorks Animation, look at the DreamWorks art of books and see how does your work measure up? Because it's going to show you exactly what these studios value. The pieces that they put into those books are like, these are the things that we think are good. Right. So if you can actually pick up a book from like Pixar or Disney or DreamWorks or, you know, any of the, you know, like the BoJack Horseman book or something, you can kind of see like, okay, well, this is the quality that they're looking for. And does my work measure up? And, you know, if it doesn't, that's not a bad thing because again, you're not static. You can keep growing. And, you know, for me, I always kind of like to have something like that open as I'm doing work in order for me to be like, okay, is, is it good enough? Does it match that in quality? Not necessarily for style, not necessarily for subject, but quality. So, you know, I think that that's a really great way to do your research. And if you're going for an internship or training program thing, most people announce that, you know, everyone's excited. They like get on their Tumblr and like, hey, I got the Disney internship. That's awesome. But you know, the other great thing about that, you get to look at their portfolio and be like, oh, that is what got into the Disney internship program. So then now you know exactly what the level is that they're looking for. So those are kind of some ways that are like practical to try to measure up your own work to see if you can actually get these positions that you're looking at. And confidence. Right. Confidence is very important all throughout your career because there's going to be a lot of times we all of us as artists have, are, are very, um, uh, I don't want to say thin skin, but we, it, we, we can't help but take criticism personally. So if you're not getting a job, it's like, well, there must be something wrong. With my... And, you know, I look at when I first started, I was thrown into this whole studio. Like a whole lot of people were way better than me. And I was like, what, why am I even here? I don't deserve to be here. But it's, you know, so don't let that discourage you. Learn from that. Like learn from those people. I look, okay, what is he doing that makes my work not as good as his? Why, how can I, and I still feel that today, but um, but I, over time, I gradually got more and more confident that I could do it. And, and that's believe in yourself and be confident. Yeah. All right, here we go. Here's another question. Um, I'm going to throw this one out for, for Pete. You can probably just give me a nice, succinct answer. We're just going to do some individual questions really quick. Okay. okay. So Pete, here you go. This is for you. Okay. How do I make my storyboards more story interesting? Hmm. Focus on what's important in the story. Uh, don't throw a lot of superfluous things in that don't matter to the story. Um, I do like to, to include things where, and it has to be production friendly too. It's like, you don't want to have a million cuts and cut to this, cut to that, cut to that. If you can get a, if you can tell that same story with less shots, include things in the background, characters walking in when you're on somebody else so you don't have to cut to another, another story or another uh, shot. Um, but tell the story and don't add a lot of superfluous um, acting and, and the, the acting will be, the performance will, will carry that through. Um, but the story is, is the most important. You're telling a story and every little thing is a story. Even just, you know, not just the big picture of like this happens from the character from minute one to the end of the, the, the picture. Every little thing tells a story. Like how does a character, when they, you have a scene where the character wakes up in the morning, well, how do they wake up in the morning? Are they cranky? Are they, are they a morning person? Are they ready for the world? Are you like, oh, I got to get my coffee? Every panel tells a story. Every pose tells a story. So it's, you break that down to story, story, story. Little bits of pieces of story make one big story. Cool. All know. right. <laughs> that's, that's great, Pete. Awesome. All right, Carly, this one's for you. Oh boy. Any, any tips for walk and run cycles those come harder for me. Oh my gosh. Oh, I would, geez, I would just say just keep animating them because they are really hard. Um, but something that also helps, as animators, you're also an actor. So you have to be able to draw the way that you act. So I will, if I'm in a studio and I don't know how to animate something and I can't find a video for it online, 
I'm going to make an idiot of myself and I'm going to take a little phone video of myself doing whatever walk that I want. And then I'm going to pause it every other second and, you know, try to get the scroll thing to go the way I need it to. Um, so I can just copy my own walk cycle frame by frame. Um, as animators, you learn by observing people. If you see someone with a really cool walk cycle, just like out in public, kind of make note of their, um, just like the unique things that they do, the way that they move, so you can incorporate that later. I would just say like, take reference. Walking is hard and you don't have to like, vary up the frames at all. Like in the animators guide, the survival guide, it has like, um, man, I don't even know, like what, like a 12 frame, 16 frame walk cycle. You don't need to change that. It's, it's good. It's solid. It's not considered like copying. You just gotta make it, make it your character, put your love into it. Cool. All right, Victoria, this one's for you. There's i uh, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here from, uh, one person. So what does it mean doing props? Okay. Um, is there multiple questions to that or just? Yeah, and the other question was, do degrees matter? I'm going for my associate's degree. A lot of positions are pretty intimidating. They want the best of the best, but I need somewhere to start. Okay, uh, degrees don't really matter. Your work matters. No one actually cares where you went to school or what yep. degree you have. A lot of people I know dropped out of college in order to get jobs because they were good enough. You know, and that's really what school is for. School is for you to have that space in order to work and learn and get better. The degree only matters to your parents. That's just true. Those are the only people who are going to give a shit about your degree. Um, in terms of props, like, wait, I'm sorry, can you repeat the props question? Um, what, what They just want to know, what does it mean to do props? What does it mean, oh, so what what does it mean to be a prop designer? Yeah, being a prop designer basically means like any object that a character can hold or interact with. Um, those are things that have to be designed. You know, like in animated films, we have to make everything. We can't just go out there and buy a, a teapot, you know? We have to draw it from scratch. So designing a teapot, although it sounds like it's very dull, it actually re requires all the same skills as, of design, period. Um, you know, you have to understand appeal. You have to understand the balance between harmony and contrast. So designing those objects is actually a really important skill and something that, you know, was most of my job when I was at Disney. I did a ton of props. So, um, you know, I think that if you can find joy in that and pleasure, then that's actually a really great position because that's really necessary for production. Cool. All right, so this is a question for everybody. Um, it's a, a little bit long. Um, Hi all, I have a traditional art slash illustration background, SCAD degree, but in film. Worked professionally in video design and marketing for 10 years, but now would love to break into character design, storyboarding, or lighting. Animation reel provided. Uh, there's no link, but it's okay. Um, is it possible to land a job with no official professional experience in animation, or will I have to intern at 32 years old? I mean, interns, are, interns at most studios, they only accept you as an intern if you're currently enrolled in college and will be returning. So you can't get an internship basically unless you are currently in school and absolutely you can get a job if you have the have the real you know if it looks good and it looks professional quality then you're absolutely in the running again just like a degree nobody cares if you did an internship before yeah i think you could also you know a lot of times people ditch to get their foot in their door they they start with production whether it be production assistant or um the assistant coordinator or something like that where you actually get to meet the people start networking and and knowing who's doing what and what production to kind of learn the ropes. And the, the trap though is, is you might get really good at production and you keep getting elevated into production. You're like, well, I really want to animate, but <laughs> so it is, it is it difficult to, to break that, but at the least you're getting the, the exposure and you're getting to meet people and start to network. And then you can say, Oh, I hear about this animation job over here. I'm going to apply for that. So I have some animation experience, but yeah, you don't need to necessarily have, uh, you know, all the animation experience to get that animation job. Yeah, if you needed to have animation experience before you could work in animation, then like none of us would be here anyways. So if you want to switch your careers at what? You said you were like 32, 33, then just do it. Like draw those characters, submit, submit the job description. Maybe you're probably better than you think you are. And because you have a live action background, you do have um, I mean, you know, the pipelines are completely different, but you still do have experience working in a very high paced, um, stressful production. So just do it, Let it just, just do it. <laughs> okay, here's a question from somebody actually that I know personally. Is it best to move out to LA 
uh, or an animation hub city uh, to look and apply for jobs at studios or is it okay to apply from the flyover region of the country? Apply from where you are. Don't move out here until you have a job. <laughs> That's my advice anyways. I kind of think it's a good idea for you to just, you can apply from anywhere. As long as you're willing to move, then yeah. That's so funny because my experience was the opposite. We're like, especially in entry level animation jobs. I mean, it's it's very highly competitive. And so studios, unless, un unless you're like Da Vinci or someone, right? Where you're just incredible skill levels. Um, studios are more likely going to choose someone who can start work next week, who lives like, you know, 15 minutes down the road, or at least, I mean, like that's, that's how it's been for me. I personally don't think you should have to live out here in LA, especially, I mean, with all the remote work that's going on right now. But um, yeah, it's, it's a tricky, it's a very tricky one. I'd say if you move to LA, be careful and don't like room with strangers. <laughs> yeah, my, my experience was a little different because I moved out here to go to school at UCLA. So, um, so I moved out, I was already out here, but I have heard of, um, uh, just talking to somebody the other day who said that she, she applied for a job at DreamWorks and she got an interview and they said, or they called her and said, can you come in uh, to um, Monday for an interview? And she's, she's like, yeah, sure. But she lived in Illinois and she didn't tell them that she lived. <laughs> she's like, yeah, I can come in for an interview on, on Monday. I'll, you know, 10 o'clock. Sure. So she booked a flight, came out and got the job. So then she's like, okay, well now I have to move here. But you know, every case is different, but yeah, it is, it is um, today, especially with the pandemic going on, every, all of our meetings are all, Zoom meetings like this, all of our uh, recruitment meetings and our application meetings and interviews, job interviews are all like this. So you don't have to be in LA. Yeah, if you're gonna apply to a job and you don't live here, don't tell the studio that you don't live here. Uh, just be prepared to take a flight for an interview or be prepared to just move at last minute. But don't don't tell them, don't tell them you don't live here um, because I, I think that, that that, I mean, they, they do prefer just hiring people that can come over from a different studio or down the road or whatever. Okay, next question. Um, Carly, you can knock this one out real quick. Any tips on fluidity in character movement and consistency of that movement? Oh, geez. Uh, fluidity, I would say um, a great way to break down fluidity in character movement is to actually like restrict the amount of frames that you use to animate. Um, so, you know, normally like two is a standard for TV animation and we're taught how to use ones and do like these gorgeous, like lots of frame drawings. Try to get a smooth motion by animating in fives and get back to me and see how that works. Mm -hmm. It really is going to prioritize what motions you do need to do without having to rely on in between too much. Yeah. Cool. It's chonky. Okay. Um... Uh, Victoria, this one's for you. For drawing a comic, what's a great tip that you'd say to young comic artists who have a budding story and characters? Oh, so definitely for comics, the thing that I would recommend is to do short comics first. Try to do something that's like 10 pages or under, so then you really get the idiom of, of comic book storytelling. If you try to like tackle a big project, like 200, 300 pages, although I admire your gumption, um, there's a lot of things that you can learn from just getting to the end of a story and the, be the best way to do that is shorts. And to do one or two shorts before you tackle a big project, that's probably the best way that you can learn how to do it. Doing it's the only way you're gonna get any better. And if you have something where you can actually see the end, then that's a lot more, it's a lot less commitment that you have to put into it. Cool. All right, um, so we're running out of time real, real fast. So let's just answer a couple quick lightning round questions, okay? Everybody ready, set, go. First job in animation. Pete? Uh, Simpsons. Carly? Shadow Machine on a canceled show. <laughs> All right. Uh, Victoria? Uh, Tangled. And I'm the same as Pete, Simpsons. So I landed it because uh, the Simpsons movie was going on, and they came to my school recruiting, and they needed people really badly. So I was able to get in on that little wave and ride it for a while. Nice. Almost nine years, in fact, until I went to work with Pete. <laughs> OK, cool. Let's see, um, good resources for anybody starting out and interested in animation. Twitter, get to know artists on Twitter. They talk about the industry all the time. Cool, next. Uh, schoolism, uh, it's a really great place where you can take classes from professionals. Pete. Uh, I'd say Animation Guild, they do have, check their website. There's also a lot of, you can, you can learn a lot about um, 
a lot of things are public information. Um, wage sur surveys and things like that that you could just you know go on the on the web page. You don't need necessarily need to be a member. Uh, I would say Facebooks and forums. Uh, find uh, community groups that have a lot of people that do what you want to do and hang out with them. Get to know people. Go to uh, live conventions whenever those start up again. And um, uh, meet people there. I mean, hanging out and becoming part of that community is uh, is paramount, I think. I also think that like, um, to, to add on to that, a lot of people ask me like, how, do, how does the internet work and how do you use it for promotion? I don't think that you should use it for promotion. You should use it for community building and you need to be a part of that community. You can't just like drop art and then leave. You have to actually be active and engage and actually like build friendship and you know give back. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, we, I think, I think we're running out of time. I'm gonna check with our uh, our people here. There's a YouTube question that um, Tom is bringing us. Any YouTube channels that you'd recommend for beginners who are interested or who are in school for animation? Any good YouTube channels? Carly, you got a YouTube channel, right? No, I do Twitch. <laughs> I watch a bunch of animators on Twitch to see the process. Carly has a Twitch channel. Oh, geez. Oh, we're going till 2.10, so we have a little bit, little, little bit more time. Cool. Well, I, I, I do know there are some um, character designers and, and storyboards that have YouTube channels. I think Dave Klistek, uh, I think Steven Silver. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think you can do just a, a, a search, a Google search, and you'll probably find a lot. For those interested in Toon Boom Harmony, there is a, a, a YouTube channel called The Bird Brain, uh, done by this uh, girl, Maria LaSalle, out in Montreal, who's mm -hmm. awesome. There is also like, like I think somebody, uh, I think Vicky, you mentioned like, uh, you know, there's there's Facebook pages of storyboard pro users of people that uh, answer questions like, hey, I, I can't figure out how to make this tool work. How did that, how does yeah. this thing, what, I have this trouble. What, how do I solve this? So, and there's a lot of people that are, I know Mike, you're on there. Um, yeah, I am. And you've answered some questions that help me out a lot of times too. So there, there's a whole lot of people out there that will, um, you can post things and you can get feedback and answer and get questions answered. Okay, um, next question. Do you have any recommendations on getting seen? I've got a lot of work I'm proud of, but I'm not too great at getting anyone to view that's outside of my circle of friends. So Carly, I think since you have uh, a way of getting seen right on top of your head. Um, <laughs> I would say make more friends, like join a forum, join Twitter, talk to artists that you like. I, I mean, follow artists, follow your peers on Twitter. I mean, like follow your, your schoolmates if you have any, like comment on each other's work, engage, um, learn, how to, learn how to socialize and present yourself as a professional. But I mean, net networking is literally just making friends. Like it's just finding artists in the industry that you have a lot in common with. Yeah, um, and, and to, to that note, Finding friends, not finding people that you can use as stepping stones. Yeah, there yeah. we go. Like, because it's so apparent. Like, if you have somebody who's almost, like, sycophantish in the way that they're approaching you, and then, uh, like, they're not really trying to be your friend or trying to get to know you on a personal level at all. They're just trying to see if you have a connection that they can use to almost use you as a vine to swing off of. Yeah, and, and and things like LinkedIn, there's that happens a lot where you know people send you like, here's a cartoon pitch idea, you should show it to Justin Rowland and Dan Harmon. I'm like, I'm not gonna do that. So, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, there's, there's I hate that. yeah, well, there's, it's it's like you're almost asking that person to put them in front of you, you yeah. know, like because you have ideas, uh, Pete. Right. When we, right. We've had lengthy discussions on on pitching and pitching shows, and there's a question about that uh, coming up next. Uh, but like you are basically saying, hey, um, I want to skip in line and I want to take all these connections that you've uh, fostered over a number of years and just get in front. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah, you have to be, you have to be careful. Okay. So next question. What does it take to create your own TV show? For an example, DuckTales or Steven Universe, et cetera. Um, so actually, I'm in development right now with Cartoon Network on my own show. Oh, um, I didn't know that. That's awesome. Well, it's, it's very new. <laughs> uh, we, we like, we're, we're still not announced yet. So that, um, so yeah, I can't really talk in detail about it. But definitely, uh, the thing that it takes is like, you have to have vision. 
like the reason why they want to pick a show isn't because it's a good idea. No one gives a shit about ideas. Ideas are cheap. Execution is expensive. So the thing about getting a show in development, you know, I don't know how to get it produced. Like we're still just doing the pilot, but you know, in terms of getting development deals at studios, what they want to see is that you have passion, you have vision, and that you're someone who can actually see this through. And, you know, if you can present yourself as like, this is my story, I know how to tell it, and I know how to make this, to finalize it and bring it to, to life, those are the types of shows that they're going to pick. Like, if just because you have a good idea, like there's a million good ideas, but are you someone who can actually execute that idea? So that's really what they're looking for. Yeah, if you can go the distance, because I, I'm, I'm sure there's been a lot of people that they've worked with over the years who have that sort of creative person flightiness that is uh, common amongst a lot of people that they're good as workers. They're great as somebody that you have like on a crew, but when it comes to them being where the buck stops, uh, they kind of just roll over a little bit. Yeah. You also have to think that they're, you're not just selling your idea. You're selling yourself to them too. You're selling yourself as a person who can, like, like Vicky said, you can get this done. It's like you might have this great idea, but if they don't have the confidence you, you to, to see it through, you know, that's going to be a factor. They're going to, there's going to be issues with that. But um, the thing about pitching is you're also going to pitch it to, you're going to get a lot of rejections. You're going to pitch it to a lot of places. You're going to, you, you can even pitch it again next year because there'll be different people in charge. But one thing you don't want to do, and I've made this mistake, you're going to get notes. You're going to say, well, what if it had a, a dog? And so you're going to, okay, I'll add a dog. I'll pitch it again. Like, well, what if I had, you know, add a little sister? So you add a little sister. Well, you know, Maybe have, put them in a, in a in a park instead of a. But what if they're animals? If you keep changing, changing, and eventually it's not your idea anymore, and then you're, <laughs> you start to lose passion for it. So don't try to predict. I mean, I've had this where like, okay, what if they're in a school setting? Like, okay, I'll put them in a school. Like, no, we don't want schools anymore. Or just to, to focus on the family uh, 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 aspect. Okay, we'll just change that. Like, no, we want to go back to the schools. And you you go crazy. So stick to your original idea of it and don't feel bad if like somebody doesn't want it and because you don't know what meetings they had the day before it's like we don't want any squirrel shows you come with this great idea was like i think it's a show about squirrels like nope so don't change it to suit somebody else keep it the way you want it and that will that passion will show through absolutely like that that's definitely another thing to really emphasize is like your show is your show and you need, and I think that like as artists, we're all really good at taking notes, but sometimes we're too good. And then as creators, we don't know which notes we need to take and which we need to leave. You yeah. need to know your story and your vision well enough that you can take the notes that are gonna matter to you and leave the ones that don't. And if someone doesn't get it, they just don't get it. You don't have to build something for them in order for them to make it. What you need to do is commit 100% to what your vision is. Because you know the thing is that animation is changing. Like we have niche markets now and like my show is something that is incredibly niche that no one has ever building something for this market before. So, you know, I was like, no one's going to buy this. But then, you know, like I met an executive who got my vision and who really saw what it could be. And it wasn't because I changed it for her. It was because she and I understood each other. So that's really what you're looking for when you're pitching. Yeah, I think that's really important too, is finding a champion inside of a studio that is willing to take a chance on your idea. Um, okay, cool. Let's, uh, Pete, there's a question for you. Oh, okay. um, it says, Pete, at the initial start of the stream, before the waterfall of names, um, <laughs> you cried out, it's never too late. Your statement was in response to Mike's lamentation and regret to a possible missed opportunity in sleight of hand. Magic. <laughs> um, he is now going to be a magician. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when talking about the animation industry, does this still hold true? Is there age cutoff for entry into the mm. industry? Does it get harder? As an older artist looking to enter into the animation industry, what sort of roadblocks or hurdles are to be expected? Uh, if there are any roadblocks, hurdles, et cetera. So that's like 10 questions. So uh, answer them all in order and very specifically. In order and very specifically, yes. <laughs> um, that is a very, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a loaded question. Um, I don't think it is ever too late. Um, I mean, if you're, if you're you know, about to retire in six months, then it's, it probably is too late because it takes a long time to build those relationships. But um, yeah, if you're willing to go the, the extra mile and, and really put yourself out there and get to know people and, you know, I, I don't think it is too late. Uh, you know, if you're in your thirties or your forties, even um, that might be something you're really passionate about and you want to change careers, then by all means, yeah, it's not too late. But having said that, you, it, it is, you know, you know, I've been doing this for more than 25 years and it does get more difficult. It gets more competitive the older you get. Uh, 
you're going to be competing with younger artists who have um, a lot more energy and you know are are more uh, up on on pop culture and references and things like that. Where um, so you do have to. You, there will be barriers. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you and say it's going to be easy. You just do it. Go do it. Do it. No, there's going to be some some barriers. Um, a good uh, production crew will have a balance of veteran artists and and younger artists because I I feel personally that it it, it is good to have that balance because veterans, you know, know how to get things done. They know okay, let's focus on this, not that. Um, but younger artists have so much energy and, and fresh ideas that like, oh, what if we did this? And you're like, oh yeah, you know, that's great. I never wouldn't have thought of that because I've been doing this for so long. So it is it is good to have that balance, but um, not having the experience could um, be a uh, not a barrier, but but a hurdle. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind as you go. Like you you are going to have to work a bit harder to com to get up to that level to compete, but it's not impossible. Yeah. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. Is there anything that you guys want to talk about or should we just keep answering questions as fast as we can get them? Yeah, let's keep going. I'm yeah, let's do it. Okay, how did you break into the industry? Let's start with Victoria. Uh, we kind of so answered I, this already, right? I, I don't know if we did. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll do it quick though. Yeah. I started in, uh, did the Disney, um, what is called the training program. So it's a program that you get into after you're graduated and it's a six month program. And then afterwards they kind of evaluate whether or not they want to keep you. So that's how I started. All right, Carly. Oh geez. There's no one way into the industry. I got it because there was somebody who like needed an animator last minute and a friend that I went to church with recommended me to the director. And then he just hired me on like the next week. <laughs> so network, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You've seen my Homer Simpson drawing. So. <laughs> in yeah, spite um, of that, I still tried to, my best to get in. And after a, a lot of hard work, I got in. But um, yeah, it was, it was uh, testing is, you know, you, you don't have to have any experience to, to, you know, find out what studio is hiring. And if they're testing, if they give you a test, great. Some tests are, are paid. They might not give you a paid test if you don't have some experience, but um, there are a lot of studios that will, you know, you, you find out they're hiring, they'll give you a test. If the test looks great and you nailed it, doesn't matter how much experience or what college you went to. Yep. Um, like I said earlier, I broke into the industry because um, I was just getting out of school at the time that a bunch of people were hiring. Uh, well, at least the Simpsons was hiring at that time. So I was able to, to sort of get in on that wave. Right um, place at the right time. Yeah, right place at the right time. O honestly, a lot of it uh, can do with avail or has to do with availability. Yeah. and um who's looking for what at the time and whether or not you fit that bill also the luck is the combination of preparedness meeting opportunity so yeah. if you want to get lucky you better be ready so be that's prepared. pretty much all you can do yeah words to live by okay um let's see what should i study in school in order to become an animation director hmm okay. <laughs> I mean, so I, I, I don't have directing experience, but I know that if you want to be a director, you're going to have to start making your own shorts. You have to start directing if you want to be a director. So learn the pipeline, just make things, just do be it. Be a good yeah. storyteller. That's really uh, yes. where directing's at, the storytelling. Yeah. And also be familiar with every aspect of production and don't just like, well, I don't know anything about background color or background paint, so I'm just going to let somebody... No, you have an opinion about something. You have a vision for it. It's your job to, you know, something isn't working in the background or a character is going to be too complicated to animate in harmony. You have to know that as a director, you have to be able to point that out ahead of time and go, okay, let's simplify this character so we can flop him or, you know, the incidental or reuse this mouth position or, or, or whatever it is. You really have to be able to, to know every aspect of it and timing. You need to know, uh, storyboard storytelling and that that's the main point is the storytelling tell that story everything else falls into place but you also have to know how those designs or how where the story is going and how everything works together and complements each other because you got to be able to hit to, to know where the, um, uh, the the troubleshoot ahead of time awesome. So learning everything it, it, it does I, I'm not that's how I became a director I learned I started 
as I said, backgrounds, learn, watch what the character designers are doing, watch what the storyboard artists are doing, watch what the timers are doing, ask questions. How'd you do that? How'd you break down that character? What, why did you put that color next to that color? Why'd you make that blue? Ask questions. Um, most people are happy to talk about what they do. And Pete has intrinsic insights into the world of human psychology. So it really helps. <laughs> that was my degree. No, it was <laughs> Okay. Um, here's a question. Is it bad? I only draw furries and animals. And should I work on drawing humans more, even though I don't enjoy it? I feel like it could be important to learn how to draw humans. Yes, it is important to learn how to draw humans. You should absolutely step outside your comfort zone and draw things you're not uh, necessarily um, happy or excited to draw. Um, which brings up a, a point to me, like in this, uh, in this industry, you're going to be drawing things that you never thought you would ever draw. Like my thing that I don't really care to draw a lot of the time is cars. I have never really enjoyed drawing cars. Some people love it. I'm not one of those people. Um, but you learn how to draw it. You learn how to draw them well, because that's one of the things that's going to be uh, asked of you. Not every show that you're going to ever come across is going to be something that only caters to the stuff that you like. So, you know, sometimes there's sacrifices like that to be made when you're um, working in the industry. I do think that that, that's kind of an important thing to talk about too, though. Like, what are your goals? If you're a furry artist, like there are ways that you can make a living by just doing that. Like you can just do the con scene. You can just do commissions. That's absolutely a valid way to make a living. But if you want to work in the industry, then yeah, there's definitely some things about being a production artist that require you to do work for someone else. Like you have a client and you need to build your skills in order to do whatever the client wants. And, you know, again, it, it just depends on what you want. Like if you want to only draw furries, then you have to know that your options are going to be a little more limited. But if that is okay with you and you understand that going into it, then that's fine. Like you probably won't be able to get a studio job only doing furries, but you can still make a living. You can still figure out how to hustle and make your way through it. Nowadays, like everything is so dem democratized and so flattened that like you can run a Kickstarter and just like do that every year and just do your own shit. And that is again, very valid. It just depends on what you want. But you should be aware that if you want to work at a studio and you want to work with other people on these big projects, then no, you don't get to draw whatever you want. You have to be good enough to do whatever's asked of you. I would say that drawing furries is awesome and don't draw furries just because people tell you not to draw furries and don't let that get in the way of what you like drawing. Um, I will say that being able to draw animal anatomy is super helpful, especially if you're an animator, because you don't really realize how hard it is to draw. Like when I was on Mr. Pickles, trying to draw Mr. Pickles, that that is so hard. Like how do his legs even work, you know? So you are going to have like an advantage when it comes to animal animations. And we do have animators on our teams um, that like usually love animal animations and specialize in that. But you still got to be able to draw people, right? So that kind of sucks. Fortunately, there's a lot of anatomical similarities. Um, so yeah, just, just learn how to do it. Just go for it. It's the yep. it's the old uh, Chuck Jones animals wearing a sock, right? You guys ever seen that? <laughs> yeah. There's there's a, a diagram that he did in one of his books where it it lays out the actual anatomic similarities between humans and animals, and where the where a human foot and an ankle and toes and and yeah. um, you know the balls of the feet and stuff how those relate to different animal parts by putting a sock on it <laughs> and, and and seeing where the sock like hits you know yeah. so that was a pretty uh, a pretty interesting uh, comparison okay yeah, we got two okay. more minutes left um let's see uh how do you combine art styles fluidly without making it messy in both the art piece and portfolio uh Examples, Amazing World of Gumball, Cartoon Cutout, 2D, 3D, Anime, etc. combined. So like if you're just a savant and you have a ton of different art styles that you're into, how do you combine those fluidly? I think that's a matter of opinion in a lot of ways, whether or not you can actually combine them and make, make them feel um, cohesive if you want them to be cohesive or if you want them to showcase that you know how to do a lot of different things. Yeah, I think that's the hardest thing to do is to come up with a style, an individual yeah. style. You can't consciously try to do it. I've tried and it, it fails miserably. You just draw what you draw. And, you know, people have asked me, like, what's your directing style? I'm like, I don't know. You have to tell me because it, it, you, you can't really consciously, I'm going to try to make this different than everything else. Like, you just draw what you draw. Pete, we should go on a vision quest together. Yeah. We'll, go the the we'll, we'll go into the desert. We'll go into the desert and we'll go on a... <laughs> We'll get some of those uh, uh, those 
uh, peppers that Homer ate on The Simpsons. <laughs> I got Those, some going uh, in the backyard in the pot. Yeah. Ultra hot Guatemalan insanity yep. peppers and go My on a gosh, visit. y'all. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm studying 3D animation. I fell in love with storyboard, but I'm not the best designer. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Like, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's okay. Separate job, so. Yeah, but you, you will know, be the the realities of production, especially in a TV production. Uh, a lot of times in storyboard, especially in the middle of the season, you would everybody starts out with the best of intentions, but so often you end up being ahead of the design department. You're like, okay, well, I don't have this room hasn't been designed yet, or I don't have this, you know, incidental character. Well, it hasn't been designed yet. You got to put something in the storyboard. So you have to be able to, to think like a designer. And, and a lot of times, and it drives me nuts when I say, well, we'll just, we'll just draw what the storyboard artists draw. Like, no, that's, they're not, their job isn't to design. It's just tell a story. But a lot of times you do have to um, be able to do that. So, um, but that doesn't mean your designs have to be great. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just it's a placeholder. Yep. Okay. So with that, we are out of time. Ooh. So I would like to personally thank you guys for coming to the stream. It's been awesome. Remember everybody out in the stream. Um, if you see the socials for these fine people, please follow them. Uh, look at their work. Uh, you could probably catch up with Carly on Twitter. She's pretty active, right, Carly? Do it. Yeah. <laughs> just just um, hit just, me up on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Real quick. If somebody wants to find you, what's the best place? Uh, Carly? At Carly Cartoons, Carly with a K R L I Cartoons. Okay, Vic Victoria. Uh, so my handles are at Victoria Ying. That's the same on Twitter and Instagram. Also, City of Secrets comes out July twenty eighth. Oh, you can't see it. There it is. Yay. City of Secrets. Yeah. Uh, Pete, Twitter where's the best place? <laughs> <laughs> Pete, where's the best place to find you online? Um, Oh, believe it or not, PeteMichaels.net, I think is that's my uh, my portfolio site. And it's got contact information there. Okay, you can find me on Facebook at uh, uh, Animike Art. Um, so Facebook.com slash Animike Art. Okay, awesome. And uh, we're going to have a raffle, I believe. Ooh. We are, and we've already picked the winner, too. And oh, my gosh. He's still in the room. It's uh, Demetria Powell. Yeah! Yeah, you won! Congratulations. Congrats. Oh, there you are. Yep. Yeah, I've got your information. Uh, you won an Intuos Pro tablet, so I'll be emailing you soon. Oh my gosh, congrats! Oh, yeah. Congratulations uh, for our fine winner. And we are going to take a short break while we get ready for the next panel, which is coming up in uh, Doodle Decode. We'll see you guys in 10 minutes. Bye. Bye, everybody. See Thanks, you everybody. in a little bit.